<laughs> so I think uh, more or less everybody's here and well, not to waste too much time we'll get started back into it again so the next thing I want to talk about is something that maybe gets forgotten a little bit uh, at different points in time it's actually uh, IO so moving things to and from the file system that you're working on so we'll talk a little bit about parallel IO and what that means in typical use cases it has been mentioned already but uh, we'll go through it again um, so the first thing I want to kind of discuss or describe is how complicated I.O. can get, um, especially on very big machines. These days, uh, what happens is, is actually the individual node boards, the individual cores and sockets don't actually directly connect to the I.O. system at all. Uh, on the BlueGene on the Blue Gene Q system in ULIC, they actually have what are called I.O. nodes, and there's two of those per rack or eight of those, sorry, per rack. Uh, and uh, so basically, all the I.O. that happens on the compute nodes gets pushed up to an I.O. node. So it gets offloaded onto an I.O. node, and the I.O. nodes are connected to these other things that actually go back to the file system. So there's this layered approach to the I.O. Um, so there's a good bit of hardware involved in there, and the, the way I.O. works has kind of changed a little bit. So basically, the, the compute nodes don't do the I.O. It's a special... Um, node boards that do the I.O., the I.O. nodes, and things get forwarded to them and they manage that whole process. And then on the back end, so once the information from Uqueen comes in, um, we actually go to our storage system then. Our one is, our big one especially, is, is, is GPFS based. So it's a big parallel storage system. It's got 20 servers on the front end, so they communicate, they come in and they communicate with 20 servers and then all the actual disks are on the back side of those servers. So it's like you've got hundreds, thousands of disks on the other side, right? So the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that it's not trivial. It's not like having a hard drive on your laptop. There's an awful lot of uh, software and hardware in between you and the, and the place where you actually want to write data. And so how the whole thing works is non-trivial and complicated. And what I want to show you today is that you shouldn't try and, or not necessarily shouldn't try and understand it, it's good to be aware of it, but um, there are tools out there to help you to avoid having to be aware of it, okay? And how it impacts your code. So there are tools to help you to do, to access it in an optimal way. And we're going to try and use one of them today. So the typical view of parallel I.O., you have a couple of different usage scenarios. You might be interacting with some kind of I.O. library, so the one that was discussed already um, yesterday even, I think, was HDF5, right? That's one that's used a lot. Um, NetCDF, another one that was discussed yesterday. Perhaps your parallel application uh, is uses MPIRO directly itself, right? So HDF5 and NetCDF, they actually are built on top of MPIRO anyway, but these are just interfaces. Um, perhaps your application actually uses directly POSIX IO. So basically, in the end, between the parallel file system and any kind of I.O. you're doing, there's this POSIX interface to the I.O. Um, that's normally the way it happens. And so the MPIO does some kind of interface with POSIX I.O. and that's how it gets written to the file system. Um, if you, your parallel ap application might be have a shared file between all the processes, so then it would directly do POSIX I.O. Um, another very, very typical use case is that you actually have task local I.O. So rather than have everyone accessing the same file, each process might, might have its own individual uh, local file right, that it's working on, on the parallel file system. And that's the kind of one we're going to look at today. So you can actually think about the way that the data is distributed in each of these cases. Um, so in the case of the parallel application, if you're interfacing with HDF5 or NetCDF or MPIIO, you actually have this shared global view. So everybody is interfacing with the library. Everybody is doing the same thing at the same time. So in that, in that kind of sense, you have a shared global view of the file. There's a single file and everybody knows that it exists. Um, um, but the, the place where there's a difference is when we have task local I.O. So in this case, you've got a distributed local view. Everybody has a little piece of the information. They're all in separate files. And when you stick them all together, you get back to this global view of the whole situation with the, with the data that you're trying to store. Okay. So what we want to do is 
interfere with this here, right? So, because this is actually has some performance problems when we do something like this. What we're going to do is intercept this little area here and try and improve on how it's done. We're going to use a special library to do that. So you have to think about parallel task local. So this idea where each MPI task is created in its own file, think about what happens at the very large scales. Typically, such, such things are used, especially for checkpoint files or restarting. Right? So basically, your application is running. Uh, it's going to be running for 24 hours. And you're running on thousands and thousands of cores. If you have a hardware problem, the whole thing crashes, you lose everything, right? If that happens on 23 hours and 59 seconds, then all your time has been wasted, right? So typically what you would have is you would have checkpoint files or restart files that you periodically, say every hour or every three hours, you write out these files so that it allows you to begin again from a particular point. So that if you do have something like a hardware failure or a network failure, it's not going to impact you so much, right? So the idea then would be that you look at the memory space at a particular type point in time, and then you dump it out to disk, and so that allows you to read it back into the disk and start again from that particular point in time. You can also use it to store your result files if you wanted to, and perhaps you want to do the result files in a task local way, or do some post-processing based on that. And they're also used a lot for parallel performance tools. Uh, the specific example would be if I was doing tracing. So you could do your tracing, when you're doing your tracing, you can do it specific to each task. So write a file for each particular task, and then you stitch them all together at the end when all the tracing is done. Right? Makes sense? Um, the different data types that might be inside, then it's the simulation data in the first two cases, and then the trace data in the, in the parallel performance tool case. And so basically, you have all these task local files, and you put the, pop, them back to, pop, pop them back to disk. Once you get to large, so the amount of files involved depends on the number of MPI processes, of course. Um, once you get to large numbers, you get large numbers of files. And this is where your problems start to, start to come in. The bottlenecks in this case are the file creation and the file management. So actually creating this number of files at one particular point in time, it takes time. Um, part of the reason it takes time is to do with the way files are managed on large parallel file systems. So you don't just have the data itself, you also have what's called metadata, so information about the data, right? Because you, these parallel file systems are built in such a way that they're, they're careful, right? They have, uh, they have checks to make sure that if it, if it loses a disk, because they have tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of disks, if they lose a disk, they don't lose all the information on the file systems. So there's certain things built inside to help it to allow to do this, and information to, to manage all this stuff is stored in metadata. So with each file, it's not just the file. You also create all the metadata as well. And every time you change the file, you change the metadata. And so all this file creation and the file management takes time. And so you can actually see the impact of this at large scale. So the one I want to show here is the, the showstopper, basically, when you have lots of task local I.O. So we're looking at the parallel creation of lots of files. On the bottom, the number of tasks here is on our x-axis. We go from 4,000 all the way up to a quarter of a million on the other side, right? We're going to grow. And the no this is the amount of time it takes to open one file for each of the tasks. This is on a log scale, okay? So, this and this is the one we want to look at first. So, this, this is your typical POSIX I.O., your standard way of doing these things. So, as we go along, we can see it takes more and more time just to open the files. And when we get to our largest point, so over at about a quarter of a million tasks, it's taking 33 minutes just to open the files. Now you have to think about how much time this is. You're talking about 33 minutes of waiting on a quarter of a million cores, right? That's about 15 years on one processor, right? Just to, just to open the files, right? So this, this means like, this is like, so it's 33 minutes, so about half that, 125,000 hours, right? processor time, which basically means, if you think about it, for a lot of people in this room, that's your entire resource allocation, just opening files before you actually do any work, right? It's huge, it's huge, the impact is huge. What we're going to use today is something called ZNlib that kind of gets around this issue by sharing a file instead. And you can see the, the impact that has means that we go from 33 minutes down to just 10 seconds. Okay, it's huge, right? And so CNLib is where it's going to come in. 
it actually steps in here and gives kind of a, you still have something of a task local going into, in, into Xeonlib, but on the back end, it actually creates a single multi-file, a physical multi-file. So basically, logically, you're still seeing task local files, but on the inside of the library, it stitches them together into a single file or a multiple files and communicates that back to the parallel file system. So on, on the, what it means in the end is that because we have this physical multi-file, we're really talking about, well, maybe typically one file. In our case, it's going to be one file, but maybe order of 10 files or something like that in the end. And that's no problem for the file system. Of course, it can handle that kind of size. The problem with shared file OO, so now we have basically say a single or multiple shared files. The problem with this shared file OO is that we have, we can potentially have concurrent access and some kind of contention, right? So you can think of this exactly the same way as caching, right? So basically the file system has some kind of cache as well. It has what are called file system blocks. And, uh, and when uh, two processes access the same block, you get serialization because one is, is managing the block at one particular time, the other one has to wait until it's finished, and then, the, and then the other one takes over. So basically it's exactly the same way that cache kind of problems arise. You can get the same thing on a file system, you get serialization because they have them accessing the same file system block. So we have serialization again. The idea with Xeonlib is that it actually does some kind of logical partitioning of the shared file. It dedicates space on a per task basis. And then it aligns that to the boundaries, right? So it basically makes sure that you never have this possibility of having some kind of shared file system block. So basically it comes in, it allocates some space, a chunk, this chunk, and it makes sure that these chunks are allocated to a boundary. So it leaves an empty space on the file system so that, so that this is the file system block along the top. And it makes sure it's synchronized with that boundary so that we never have the problem that we could have a shared file system block. All right, and that's basically it. So we have different tasks. So these are tasks one, two, three. They have different pieces of data in different chunks, but all those chunks are allocated to a particular set of uh, file system blocks. It looks a bit better on the slides than it does on the screen, unfortunately. Yeah? How much would this justice uh, rearrangement of the architecture is meaningful? I would say, I mean, yeah, but if it, I, I can only look at it as a, as a, a single hard drive. I mean, this won't help at all. Right? Yeah. If you have a parallelized system, only then that matters, right? Um, yes and no. So it depends on your hard drive a little bit. So, so, so how file systems operate. So basically, the, these, these file system block sizes, you can decide how big they are, right? Absolutely. So when you create, when you format your file system, you say, I want the file system block size of one kilobyte, or one megabyte, or ten megabytes, right? Yeah. And then these things could potentially impact you. Typically, on your laptop hard drive, you have a very small file system block size, so you won't really see these things, right? But on a parallel file system, to get the bandwidth, you have much bigger ones. So you can have file size blocks, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's like four, four, Four or eight megabytes would not be uncommon, right? This fixed the overlap problem. This fixed this potential problem that you could have. Like I say, when you have these small file system blocks, you probably won't see them. But on the larger systems, it's very easy because it depends on exactly what you're doing. If you're dumping a lot of data, you won't see it so much. If you're dumping little tiny amounts in small files, you'll see it an awful lot. So. The architecture of CNLib, I mean, we don't really need to worry about it so much. It's actually not so complicated. Uh, it has, you have the application. It interfaces with the library somehow. There's a different set of calls depending on exactly what type you're doing. If you're just doing MPI or just doing OpenMP or doing some kind of hybrid, you just have a slightly different call. It comes back into a general uh, interface. That goes back into a serial API, which it goes into the POSIX into the POSIX I also communicates with the file system. Don't really need to know too much about it. It's just an extension of the I.O. or POSIX or NCC. Um, it has bindings for C and Fortran. They're the ones that are typically used. It's implemented actually in C. The current version, we actually have a newer one on the, on the Euclid system. So these slides are, well, I think we're 1.4 B3 or something like that. It's open source. You can download it and use it yourself. It's just uh, on that web link. 
the basic idea is it looks very much, we'll see it in a second, it looks very much like normal, F open, F right, F close, okay? Has some extra parameters in the open, but the right looks identical, more or less, and the close looks identical as well to the typical uh, F right, F close. In a nutshell, uh, here's what a typical task local I.O. would do. Um, you create a file name based on some file name that you were given as a parameter. Um, you'd add, you'd tack on your particular MPI ID on the end, so that becomes your task local file. You just open it up, you say, I want the binary write, I just want to dump out some data onto it. Uh, when you're writing, you just tell it, um, here's the data, here's uh, um, the amount, uh, the number of bytes in the particular uh, data type, and just dump it to this place, close the file. Right? So it's normal, this, this is the normal stuff. Um, no collective operations, no shared files, all you're doing is dumping a stream of bytes out into disk. Here's the same thing, except with this C on lib stuff. Um, we tell it how many files we want to create, we tell it what particular chunk size of data we want to use, and then we open the file. A lot of, some of the parameters are the same, and some of them are different. Uh, we, of course, we have these MPI parameters because we have to give them to, so it knows about the MPI environment a little bit. Um, there's a, the global communicator. There's the local communicator in case, I mean, there's no re Here, in our case, we're not going to have anything other than the global communicator, but sometimes maybe you have different communicators doing different things in your MPI regions or something like that. So you might have something like a local communicator that's specific to you. And the chunk size is just some piece of information that you decide uh, how big you, how big the data is you want to dump to disk at particular times. The chunk sizes can be different for different processors and stuff like that. Of course, it's a local thing. Uh, the file system block size is something you might not know, right? So you might not, as a user, be aware of what exactly the file system block size is. It's really easy to find out, but you actually don't need to worry about it. If you just give a, um, if you just give a, a null pointer, I think here. It'll figure it out, on CLib will just figure it out on its own. You'll see it in the example anyway, exactly what you need to give. Um, the global rank, just which rank I am inside the MPI com world. Uh, the file pointer, uh, the file pointer actually you don't, we don't need as well. You, we'll go through it in the example anyway. And then the new file name. So, so this is something that will return. It'll tell you exactly what file it created in the end. So when it comes to the write statement, nothing has changed it's from the fwrite more or less. So we have Z and F right. We have the data, the number of the, the 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 number of elements, and then the size of the elements. And instead of having the file pointer, we now have this SID, okay, the C and lib ID that we pass instead of a file pointer, and that's basically it. And then we close that SID when we're finished dumping the data. So it does some clever stuff on the inside. It includes checks to make sure that there's enough space in the current chunk, and if there's not, it allocates a new one. Um, Basically, that the parameters that, that the only parameter that has really changed once you get past the open statement is that instead of having a file pointer, you now have this C and lib ID, and that's essentially it. Now we're going to do a little bit of hands-on. Ah, uh, this should should not say MPI directory; it should say I/O directory, because now we're going to do uh, the, the I/O stuff. Uh, take a look over at this base uh, Maybe we'll do it together now in a second. Load this particular module, the CNLib one, um, and then you can compile. You can compile base the base. We can run it and stuff. And you can get some arguments back. And then the next thing we do, we're actually going to try and do something with the with the CNLib. So maybe I'll just walk you through. I think I'll just walk you through the the code to explain what it is I was trying to do. Uh, instead. So that's the, the correct directory. It should have been I/O and. What happens if you are working with MPI I/O? I mean, the, the, the idea of this is to give you a simple example. 
if you use MPIO, that's fine, right? You're already doing something a bit more clever, right? This is this. The idea of this is to give you an example. So I, I kind of let me talk through this example, and you get an idea of what I mean. That guy library, which makes this thing Yeah, so, so I sh I sh I'll give a specific example of the typical use case that you might be thinking about. If you already use, uh, a sh you know, a library routines like NetCDF or HDF5 or MPIO, you've already thought about this problem. This is more or less geared towards people who haven't thought about this problem yet. Um, yeah, this code is, is pretty simple. Uh, let me do it less instead. Okay, just does some initialization stuff first. Uh, interprets the command line, creates an array. So, basically, it creates an array. The now it doesn't do any work here, it just creates the array, right? But the idea is that this is our data, that we're in the middle of our simulation and we've done lots and lots of hard work and now we have this data, right? And we want to do a checkpoint at this particular time and dump out our data so we don't lose everything, that, the work that we've done already. So that's basically what we want to do. We have this, this array called data, my data that contains all this important information that we don't want to lose, right? So that's basically it. We just want to dump this my data to disk. Um, Later on, we calculate that product. That's just to see exactly what it is. So you can compile it and run it, and it will just give you some answer back for that product. Right? It's really simple. Doesn't do anything. What we want to do is say, at this point in time, I have very important information stored in my data, and now I want to make it. I want to dump it to disk. So I want you guys to try and use ZNlib to dump it to disk. So basically, those commands, everything you need, is more or less on. Um, Everything you need, all the commands to understand what parameters you need to give to CNLib, they're on this slide. So if you haven't got the slide, it's on the website. Um, so everything you need is there. So the hard part is doing the open, right? Just getting all the arguments right for the open. What I've done to make life easy for you is I've created a, a file called base with variables underscore right, right? So it has all the variables inside already. So the only thing you have to do it's translate the variables into the function call, and it should just work for you, right? And it even explains each variable one by one. Maybe there's one or two missing, and then we can talk about those explicitly. No, and that's usually really expensive to implement because you have to take the entire snapshot of the entire memory space at a particular point in time. Yeah, but it still can be expensive, right? If people are, if they're doing HPC stuff, that could be potentially the entire memory space, more or less, right? Yeah, there's still a lot of disk once you start talking about a you know, hundred thousand or a million cores. Uh, that's a lot of memory space, right? But if you want to recover the mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Ah, uh, well, typically what you do is you bleed. You want it to uh, keep running from the same time. Yeah, but typically you bleed before you do a maintenance. You bleed the system, right? So you'd empty the queue. You say just before you empty the queue, you checkpoint all the systems. No, no. I mean, you bleed the system slowly. You let the jobs finish, and then you empty it out. So if somebody can't fit in before the window, they don't run. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it lost a lot of dependencies. Original base, I compiled it with make, well, and... Uh, um. Like I think, show me, show me which module you loaded. I think you loaded the Intel one and not the... Not the module list. Yeah. No, you're right. That's right. Well, let's see what I got. Uh -huh. Why? Why did that happen now? Ah, there's an error in the submission file. Why the hell? So, in the submit.qsub file, there's an error. I load the wrong module. So, I have the wrong module loading in here. It should have been the, the Go MPI versions of both of these modules. I'm sorry. Um, what's the easiest way to fix it? I think I'll fix it. I'll copy it to slash temp and then you just put it back or something like that. Because, um, okay, let me just fix it. So. Um, Uh, actually, another way. To, there's another way to fix it. Which which one did I tell you to load? What module did I say to load? And go MPI. Yeah. Hmm, surprised it worked for me yesterday. I guess I didn't try hard enough. Um, Okay. Uh, don't worry about it in this. I'll just put it in slash temp, and you can do you just copy it directly from there. So instead of that, we want to go MPI toolchain. Oops, we want version 1.4.10. Same for here. Hopefully, it should work. Dash go MPI. Dash. 4.10 um, oh, a lot of people running stuff I put it into the um, the slash temp directory so all you need to do is just cp slash temp uh, submit dot qsub dot right so just put the new one into into the current directory and that hopefully should work for you we'll try it in a second now still queued I think we might have a problem because of that dodgy script. Who's, who's user 23? Can you delete those two jobs? Because they probably won't work anyway. Just do QDEL. And then they're just 4545 and 4546. That'll delete the two jobs, yeah. And and zero two as well. Like probably they're all wrong. Um so Getting there.
Okay. Yeah, okay, that works fine. So the new submission script should be okay for you. It doesn't do anything, basically. So it should take almost no time. All right. Um, yeah, I don't want to take up too much time. We only have like 55 minutes left, and I still have to give another presentation as well. Um, inside the base with variables. We had all these new parameters that I explained. Uh, it's inside the file to exactly what they are. So what you have to do is just insert, um, yeah, insert the file open, dump it, that kind of thing. Uh, we might not have time because uh, I do want to talk about the pray stuff a little bit and get a bit of feedback from you guys. So yeah, it, if it's not compiling or not working, the solution is in the directory too. If you look at the uh, C on par dot C, you can see down further it has the uh, it has the open the particular open statement that you would need based on what it, on the information I gave you. So it has the file name that comes from above. You're saying you're doing a binary read. That should be a binary write. Maybe I'm at the wrong statements, right? Sorry. The first one is up here. We're doing a binary write and the number of files. The global communicator, the address of the local communicator, the chunk size, the file system block size, global rank, and null is the file pointer because we actually don't care about the particular file pointer anymore. So when, when I put this parameter null inside, it allows, yeah, so I have it explained here. We deliberately don't pass a file pointer because we don't need it anymore within our code. All we're using is these SIDs, these C and lib IDs. <laughs> so we don't care about the file pointer. But it does give, it can give it back to you if you want, right? So it means that you could somehow interact with the file. Typically, you don't want to do that because you'll mess up with, or, so if, if you do mess around with the file, then C and lib has to take some care because it knows that potentially you changed the data or did something to the file. So because of that, it doesn't do a lot of optimizations. So if you give it a non-null file pointer, it goes, hang on, they might want to do something with the file. I don't know what they're going to do, so there's a lot of things that I have to be very, very careful about. So if you give a null, then it goes, that's fine. I completely control the pointer, so I can do lots of optimizations, okay? Uh, so we open the file. That's, that'll be your open statement in the end. Uh, we're going to write the data out. So it's my data. The size of the data is, um, oh, it's actually the size that goes here. So it should have been size of double, right? So, because each, each element of, of data is a double, so it's, this is the number of bytes. Size of will return the number of bytes involved. So, it's size of double, dimension of the array, and then uh, the C and lib ID. So, it more or less looks like what you would see in an F write command. What is a new file? Hmm? Why should we need a new file? Uh, the new file name. So, so F name, yeah. The new, fi the new file name. So, basically, at the end, depending on what you put in here for the number of files, it will have a new file name. So basically you have the, the base file name plus some number on the end. So if you tell it to op create 10 files, then obviously they can't all have the same name, so they have some extension. So this is an extension? Though? So it will add to the extension. So you have the base file name, and then it will create a new file name, which is, includes the little extension on the end. Do you know what I mean? All right, so that's basically it. So you can, if you didn't manage to get the to read the write, you can more or less take it from here, copy it and paste it into the other file, um, and then you're supposed to run it, All right? So compile it and run it. Com compile it again. Yeah. Aaron? Yeah. Are there any other uh, commands like uh, print, uh, print using the Zion libraries? No, it's not really intended for that. This is really just for dumping out data, right? So, I mean, you can do whatever you want in the sense that, like, it dumps things from the local task. It reads them 
from the file into its, you can do whatever you want then. It's just data, right? It's just the, the data you hold in the memory, that's all. I actually don't know this specifically the other functions that it have, has I really don't know. I just took this kind of simple case, right, for here. Of these exercises? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the exercises? No. I mean, the exercise is relatively simple because uh, it's a fake, right? It's a fake exercise. So all you would need to worry about is the function calls in Fortran. And then you just need to check what they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just need to check what they are, that's all. So there is Fortran implementation? Yeah, Fortran and C. Yeah. And C that they're working on at the moment. Yeah. All the stuff we showed, it's all in Fortran and C, and now with all the new languages, such, such as Python, and all the C++ and Java, does they use different I mean, languages at all, or uh, they have some... So, so I, 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 what you do in terms of t t t the big languages in HPC these days are like C++, probably if you were learning from scratch, I'd say you should learn C++, right? Uh, Fortran code, as it's this Fortran code around from the 60s and the 50s, right, that's still being used on HPC systems, right? Um, C is around for a long time as well. Java is no good for, for high-performance computing. Python, maybe, but typically to get high-performance from Python, what you do is you fake it a little bit. You just use Python as a kind of a, the environment that it gives you, allows you to code things fast, but if you want high-performing routines, they're typically written in either Fortran or C and Python just binds to them, right? So it wraps them somehow. And so, so basically, typically what you do, you, you could write your whole application, there is MPI Python and stuff like that. But if you want to get the high performance out, you would take the important piece and you would do that in C or Fortran, which would, because it would allow you to squeeze out more performance. So hopefully some of you have managed to actually create a file at this stage. How do you know that you are choosing the parallel file system? Uh, you, you don't care. Uh, you let ZNlib worry about all that stuff. So how it actually writes the file to disk and considering the file system, uh, you mean in general how would you know as a user? You don't see it, you just see the mounted directory. Right, so. But uh, when you see, when you check the file systems, you see only the own directory and the uh, only the way you run your code, it has an access to the parallel file system. Maybe. Yeah, so in, in, on Euclid, there is no parallel file system, right? It's just a shared NFS directory. It used to have a Lustre file system, which would have been a parallel file system, so you would have got better bandwidth. Um, but it doesn't at the moment. Um, so, so typically, we'll see it in a little bit when I talk about the press presentation. Typically, on a file system, you will have a home directory, like a home space that's backed up and everything. The workspace, the scratch file system, will not be backed up because it's like it's intended to hold big data and not be backed up. I mean, it has RAID and things like that, but it's not going to have anything more than that. So that's supposed to be fast access scratch space, right? And that's typically called, well, in a lot of systems that I've seen, it's called dollar work. So you have your dollar home and your dollar work, right? And when you run your application, you want to do it in dollar work. If, if, if you have a lot of file system usage, you want to do it in dollar work. But yeah. Uh, during, uh, when Job run, runs all the uh, intermediate uh, reading writing, it happens locally on the node, and then it no. writes into no. the storage. This is how, how it happens uh, in our, our system. Well, it depends on your implementation. Typically, the answer would be no to that, right? Um, because that's not a good way to implement a, a file system, right? Because what happens if all of a sudden the network gets severed? What status do you have on the file then? Is it new or old or the, this is what I mean, right? So typically, typically no, that's not the way it would be done. You would have like a G, you would have like a GPS service routine on the node. You interact with that, and it communicates over InfiniBand back to the file system, and then it has all its consistency checks and whatever inside, right? No, this is in general. This is in general. If you if you are using the parallel file system, dollar work, you are using GPFS. Right? Okay, we don't have parallel file system. So in that case, I don't know what you have. You might have... Storage. We have NFS for... NFS. Share user 
directories, which yeah. are, you, you start local with all the programs installed and user directories. And then you have, uh, and the user, uh, basically it's uh, the um, uh, separate storage. Uh, I can imagine what normally happens then in that case, what normally happens, or at least what I imagine would happen in this, that, so you, do you have a global file, a space at all? But then it must be running something, right? It has to be. Is that NFS mounted as well, or what? NFS is mounted everywhere. Right, but all is that for the home space or for everywhere? Yeah. All the nodes, see the, all, all the... I mean, that's bad, right? So, so you're going to get bad performance from NFS. It's not intended to be... Yeah. So in your case, what I would do is I would use the slash temp directory on each node. This is what it's done. It, it is doing. We have GTMP or TMP you know, yeah. on each node, and uh, the local disk is l rather large. Yeah. And uh, all the during yeah. the computation, all the writes are local. And then at the end of the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not a parallel file system, right? So this stuff doesn't work. Because they can't see each other, all these disks. So, yeah. yeah. So I mean, does it work in that case? And yeah, okay, that's what you have to deal with, right? But, um, but in, the, in case of checkpointing, uh, each time uh, the checkpoint files are written, they are written to the first. In your uh, yeah, if the, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is not this. You don't have a parallel file system, right? This is how to get maximum performance from a parallel file system. You don't have one, so. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully you managed to, to write a file. The second part would have been to read that file and then to compare the results before, after, you, after you wrote the file and then sort of compare the two results. Uh, the read would have been very simple. Instead of having BW, you have BR, right? And instead of having a read, you have a write statement. Or instead of having a write, you have a read statement. And that's it. So you should have been able to make two trivial changes and compare the two. And you can also see within the... LWM output, you can see exactly what kind of bandwidth you're getting to the disk, right? So how much how much data you're able to transfer to the disk at any one time. On this particular system, it won't be so astoundingly fast because it's not a parallel file system; it's just a local disk. But you should be able to maximize that local disk access. So it should be like the maximum you can get to that disk space, which is good. All right. Um, yeah, I think it's. So you can give, maybe I'll give you two minutes just to, to try it out. Or even you can just make the let this, the C on power example and just run that so you can see exactly. So what Zion actually does, it gathers the buffers from all the MPI tasks and then combine them together and then write them to the power file system? Uh, not, not quite. What it does is allocate space in, in chunks and then make sure that those chunks are aligned with file system boundaries. And so each chunk could be a different size based on the process. So one process might want to write a thousand megabytes and one process might want to write a megabyte. And so the chunk size for each process might be different. So the file, the, the way the file is organized would depend on that. But, but basically from your side, you don't care, right? CNLib takes care of all the, all the way that stuff works in the background. All you care about is, I want to dump this data, whatever this data is, per process basis. I dump it to disk and then I read it back and that's it. And so it just makes sure that in terms of what happens, it'll be optimal for the file system. But how many tasks are actually writing the data? Um, yeah, that, that depends. So that's what Zenlib takes care of underneath. So that depends on how things work. If you're on, for example, the BlueGene system, it, it creates one file per I.O. node. And the I.O. it knows, it's aware of the architecture, and knows that the I.O. node ultimately is the one that does the writing. So it steps in the way there and just makes sure that that writing from the I.O. node is done correctly, right? So there might be, it has inside probably special hooks for that particular way that I.O. is done and it intercepts those. So, I mean, if you were doing it, you'd have to know all that information yourself. This is the whole point of this is to abstract you from that a little bit. So basically, you get a new system like an IBM with the special files, with the special way it does I.O. or a Cray or something like that. And this steps in and allows you to ab abstract you from how, how it does those things and just do it in an optimal way for you. So there might be special tips for a particular machines. So when you configure the Scion uh, library, 
you consider the architecture of uh, the Yeah, you can do that or it might already be inside. It might have some queries that it can figure this stuff out on its own. It might know, like for example, it knows fr from the fact that you're using the BlueGeneQ compiler, it'll know, right, that, that you're on a BlueGeneQ system. But the the fine-tuning is done when you install the library. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, no, when you install the library, yeah. So that's why, I mean, you're, you're loading a particular module for a cluster system here, right? If you had, if you were on BlueGeneQ, you'd be loading that particular module, which is already configured to run. So when you build it, when you build it, that's when you tell it all that information. So the parallel system is much faster. Right, so so well, maybe in the next slide, I think you'll see how fast our file system is. Um, so so. Yeah. So parallel file parallel file system is much larger. And much faster, right? So the idea is, is, is yeah, that basically that you have a much larger file system, and the idea you should have big bandwidth to it. I mean, the reason you have lots of disks is so you can write to lots of disks at the same time, which means that you have much more output to disk that you can actually do. So you can dump a lot of data much faster. I think, uh, yeah, on this slide you can see the bandwidth that we get in ULIC. This is on the old system. We're getting 25 gigabytes per second. Okay, so we're dumping 25 gigabytes per second to disk on our old file system, right? Uh, on the new file system, we're up to 120. So we're dumping 120 gigabytes of data per second. Right? That's part of the reason you would do it. You can't do that. Obviously, that's not possible. Using how many IO nodes? This is an, it depends on the file system, but this is 65,000 cores. So you divide that, how many racks is that, and then you can figure out how many I/O nodes that is. I'm not sure exactly. Basically, when you use a rack, you're using eight I/O, IO nodes. So the job size divides down to number of racks, and then you know how many I/O nodes that is. You have one uh, I/O node per rack? No, you have eight, eight per rack. So it was this picture at the very beginning. It kind of shows you have eight I/O nodes per rack. So that's basically it. You can see, you don't hit the on the old system. You don't hit the maximum bandwidth till you get up to about 32,000 cores. Uh, we don't even start measuring here until we get 65,000 because our ta this is tasks actually, because we can get up to almost two million tasks on the system, right? But we hit the maximum bandwidth of the of the file system early, pretty mu pretty much early on. Um, yeah, that was the old file system. This is the new one. So yeah, we, we just upgraded our file system, so, so you can see we've had a big increase in the bandwidth available to us, because there's new GPFS and there's other like, new features in there. Um, there are problems that you should be aware of, uh, one of them is portability. So I don't know if you've heard of it before, it has been mentioned already this week, uh, endianness. The way things are stored depends on the, who built the system, basically, who built the file system. Um, so there's an example here that can show you too, the, the difference between the actual bit patterns between little endian and big endian, right? For a particular number, it's a 32-bit number. The conversion of files from the two different formats can be, uh, well, might be necessary and it can be very expensive. Um, the solution in this case, of course, will be choosing something that's a portable data format anyway. Like I'm not, I can't get into how to use HDF5 or NetCDF, but that's a portable data format that you could use. Right? It's a little bit harder to use. This is the idea of this library that I get, told you about, is that it's relatively straightforward and simple to use. HDF5 and NetCDF may be a little bit more complicated. Uh, in terms of a strategy to choose, you should think about performance. How much data are you talking about dumping in the first place? What's your frequency of reading and writing? And how much scalability do you really need? Um, if you're only scaling to 100 cores, and you're happy enough with your task like your IO, local I.O., that's fine. But once you start hitting the big numbers, lots of tasks, this is going to be a massive bottleneck for you, so you have to be aware of that. Uh, the portability argument, again, 
different HPC architectures, different Indianness. Uh, you might also want to exchange data with others. It's binary data typically, so you have to be careful about this Indianness. And then, of course, there's long term storage as well. If you're doing long term storage, you want to think about HDF5 or NetCDF, something that's be supported for reads into the future. Um, you can, of course, use two different formats and then convert between them, which might be good for checkpoints and restart files. So internally, we read and write the data as it is, dump it really quickly to disk, read it back up, right? For restarts, that's useful. So on a particular system, if you want to do restarts, this is a really nice file format, I think, uh, for this. Once you go externally, though, then probably one of the data, data formats for to go outside is what you need. Um, so this can be portable, system independent, and self-describing. So HDF5, uh, NetCDF, something like that would probably be helpful for you. So kind of you can think about things in this way, uh, the internal and the external world. How do you want to, how do you want to pass data between the two? So uh, just uh, you show me, uh, internal, I mean, if I'm having, I'm using the same system, and I'm like using, like, let's say, uh, 240 nodes, uh, cores, and now if I'm using 241, that's already external, right? If you want to restart the job with a different number of CPUs. Well, no, CNLib is a bit smarter than that now. It depends a bit. You need to understand what you're doing. So typically for a restart file, you would restart with the same number of nodes. And that's, originally, that's kind of what it expected. Nowadays, it doesn't. It's a bit more flexible than that, right? But I, don't, I can't cover that here. I actually don't really know exactly what, what the current status is. But the functionality is being extended, right? So you can read a file... If you wrote it with 240 threads, you don't need to read it with 240 threads. It can read it. It has some metadata hidden inside, so it knows it knows these things a little bit. So the function, the functionality, there's more functionality there that maybe I, I haven't, co I certainly haven't covered today. Um, yeah, that's basically it. I think yeah, Wolfgang Frings is the developer. He's he's in the in the office next door to me in Ulick. Um this is a shorter version of one of his presentations. Uh, these virtual institute go around Europe, given the, the workshops, and he does one of the presentations there. Um, and they also help me with the, the base examples in the tutorials as well. Um, yeah. Question we have done previously: uh, If you are writing uh, some data like uh, checkpoints, and you run your job with a certain number of processors. After a month or two, you don't remember how many processors you have, or you like to run it now with a larger number of processors. Or From that number of processors, what will happen with the, these data files or, or, or that uh, data? File? So, I, I mean, uh, I, I, I pass the examples here. I haven't used it that much. My understanding is is that that's not a problem, right? But of course, don't forget that this is binary data being dumped, right? So you need to know what it is you're going to be reading back in a little bit, you know. So it's dumping binary data. So you need, you, you need to have, as the person who wrote the code, you need to have the global view, right? So it's a... No, 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 not, not like that. I mean, you need to understand what the global view is. So you need to know what your code was writing at a particular time. So if you think of it with like a, a, an array of data, right? You have a big array of data that you've cut up into pieces, right? So you need to know how you cut up the pieces, and then you can read them. Because, uh, sorry, the, the program is uh, a program. Yeah. The code is a code, but when you run it, you can choose to run it with uh, 100 processors or 1,000 processors. Yeah, yeah, so, so then... It's so not something that you can see in your code. <laughs> it's a runtime. That, that, that's a runtime, right? But the global view of the data, like the parameters you give to the code, were yours, right? You decided what parameters give. Apart from the number of processors, you decided, right? So you, as the programmer, have the global view of the data. You know what, how they join back together to give you the global view, right? So when you cut up a matrix, you know what the whole matrix should be, right, coming from these processors. And you only dump the whole matrix. So when you read it back in, okay, it might be to a different number of processors, but you're the one who decides what goes where, you know, how you read. Yeah? Okay. So that's it with the hands-on. You won't have to do any more. Uh, the last presentation I have is, um, is again back to this pray stuff a little bit, just to, you can approach this one as a discussion maybe or something like that. 
um, so that we can have a little conversation about it. And I don't think it'll be too long. I have 30 minutes and I won't take that. It's a, 